In a grim and dark future among the vast ocean of our galaxy, there may be worlds where humanity treats its members as little more than cogs in a machine or ants in a hive, but what would such worlds truly be like? So welcome to another Sci-Fi Sunday here on SFIA, where we look at concepts popular in science fiction and ask how realistic they are or how they might operate if they came to fruition, and today we'll be looking at the concept of hive cities and hive worlds, the grim and dark urban settings of so many sci-fi stories. They are bleak places where you always wonder how anyone survives and where all the food comes from, which we'll be spending a fair amount of time discussing today as getting food and energy in, along with waste and heat out, are the big bottlenecks of these depressing places where the only laughter is cruel or dark humor, and we'll have a fair amount of that in today's episode too, but as many the administrator of a hive city can tell you, dark humor is like food, not everyone gets it. There are many settings that talk about enormous megacities and indeed we even did an episode on megacities some years back, but not very many books or shows really go into detail especially on the truly enormous cities. To really look at the idea in detail, ever since we started seeing the big migration to cities and emergence of skyscrapers, folks have tried to imagine super cities, and often in a grim and dark light. Indeed the movie usually considered the first big budget sci-fi film is named Metropolis and explores a dystopian view of life in those cities, with people treated like robots and indeed an android being built, one of the first seen in sci-fi. We also see that in Caves of Steel, Isaac Asimov's first robot novel, which is set in a hive city of future New York. His imperial capital in the Foundation series, Trantor, and its twin in Star Wars, Coruscant, both explore planet-wide cities, what we also call a Eucumenopolis. But a hive city or hive world is not simply a big city, the implication is layer after layer of bleak enormity, a dark place, physically and emotionally, sprawling in barely structured chaos. Amusingly, a lot of the best film examples, like Metropolis or Blade Runner, my own favorite film, are set in the future past, as Metropolis takes place in 2026 and Blade Runner in 2019 and Soylent Green in 2022. The artistic inspiration for them and the cyberpunk genre they helped inspire is heavily drawn on the hard-boiled detective and film noir genres, which are almost inevitably set in bleak crowded cities where life is cheap and we see parallels in stories like Robocop or Judge Dredd. Far future Dying Earth genre settings often have it too, and Gene Wolfe explores it in the enormous city of Nessus in his Book of the New Sun series, but probably nobody goes into such detail as the Warhammer 40,000 setting where we have a crumbling galactic empire of millions of worlds, many thousands of which are hive worlds or have one or more giant hive cities or forge worlds, essentially huge factory planets, and often on these the air is so toxic that to step outside would kill you, albeit living inside merely kills you a bit slower. In these places, you are lucky if your role in life is merely to be a tiny minor cog in the machine, as the alternatives are to be discarded and become a decaying part of a now broken machine, or to be trying to scrape out a life living on the detritus and garbage fallen down from higher levels. I thought today we would explore the realism of such worlds, Though since it is so linked with more dystopian sci-fi and fantasy, we will not hold their feet too much to the fire. It is also my favorite genre and we'll be discussing a lot of my favorite bits of fiction, so I want to emphasize that their realism or lack thereof is not really pertinent to whether or not they are good stories. I am not sure a hive world can ever really be divorced from the notion of the decaying giant, even is a bit antithetical to the general premise of the channel that the future is a pretty awesome place to live but we'll discuss some of the flaws in that thinking that makes them awful places. At the same time, as we noted in our Mega Cities episode and our discussion of space habitats and Dyson spheres, the sheer enormity of such places would, by default, mean we always had vast amounts of derelict spaces. Even a very competent and well-resourced leadership is going to need time to handle changes. If we assume only 1% of various spaces are in overhaul or derelict at any given time, which would indicate an exceptional city or regional manager, then when we're talking billions or trillions of people, that means millions or billions living in those derelict spaces. Tiny margins aren't so tiny when the whole is so immense. 
A street gang in modern terms and size might scale up on a high wall to represent a million person strong army, even if their crime rates were lower than ours. In a grim context and to set the tone for today's discussion, your typical human corpse contains enough calories to feed a person for two months. This obviously makes cannibal civilizations leaving on entirely soil and green rather implausible, but it does mean it's a non-trivial dietary supplement and means that if people typically live 70 years or 840 months that a city of a billion people could support 2.4 million dedicated cannibals, and far more on a diversified diet. Not that we would expect people to typically live 70 years in such places, or for everybody to get eaten, or for the cannibals to only eat people not other food like grain or rats. Indeed a hive world without giant mutant rats is no hive world at all, and with all the other wasted food going to the garbage you could have entire hunter-gatherer civilizations living in some enormous landfill gathering garbage like they were nuts and berries, foraging for mushrooms, fighting giant rats and cyber seagulls for the detritus, and occasionally making a meal of them or the other way around. And the sad thing is this doesn't actually require the rest of civilization be all that dystopian, this sort of rogue civilization could exist even inside a larger post-scarcity one, indeed it might not even require that civilization have a great scarcity of compassion. But let's talk scale here first and not just in terms of physical size and people, but also of time. A city is a huge thing which sprawls and shifts with time, and for those of us in the US where those cities are often only a few lifetimes old, it is easy to forget that when it comes to great cities, whether they were built on the coast, or a fertile riverbank, or a rocky and defensible hill, what that city is mostly built on, as time goes by, is itself. We often see a pyramid theme in hive cities, but it might be more appropriate to view it as a mountain, a heap tossed upon itself, as layer after layer gets built and those before them get torn up, compressed, lost, and rediscovered. This is not necessarily vertical either, in Gene Wolfe's Nessus the city is essentially slowly flowing down the river as the world cools off and it migrates away from its nominal old downtown region, a spaceport full of wrecked old spaceships that everyone unknowingly uses as buildings. Wolf does a magnificent job in that series of quietly showing, rather than telling, the readers that many of the mountains were long ago carved into statues, that a cliff face is now some statue's actual face, and that the term for minor now essentially means grave robber, as everything is just built over top itself, or something else, from millions of years of humanity living there and slowly ebbing as the sun dies. So the critical piece to remember about something like a hive ward or city is that it probably wasn't built according to any grand plan, or in any given era, and that it's gone through countless episodes of renewal, restoration, and collapse. These need not have been individually epic, because the scale involved is. So the city need not have been nuked till it glowed and got rebuilt, but maybe once every few hundred years some terrorist group does manage to set off a nuke somewhere in the city or unleash some chemical accident that renders a chunk of it uninhabitable for a time, or a train carrying dangerous chemicals derailed or a reactor melted down and rendered part of the city unsafe or undesirable for decades. Even if someone wants to do a big renewal project, it takes decades to get the place picked and planned, and then even longer to buy or acquire all the parcels of land, horizontal and maybe vertical, that you need. You may even want the area to decay further to make that cheaper or easier to invoke eminent domain on. Funding might dry up partway through, requiring revisions, and all the while the area is basically decaying garbage heap being used by the lost, the desperate, criminals, and desperate lost criminals. If such a project takes decades, even if big renewal projects like that were only needed every few centuries, you would still have a respectable fraction of your hive as a constant dumpster fire even if everywhere else was pretty awesome and pleasant and indeed you might have sections that were on fire for years at a time, or others where an entire forest or jungle had sprouted up inside the structures. We also have one other critical piece to contemplate in regards to realism, and that's heat and energy. As we often see with megastructures we discuss on the show, it's not where you get your energy from, but how you get rid of it once it inevitably turns into heat. And the same applies to food production. Every piece of food people eat takes energy to make or import, every appliance they use does too, 
and it all ends up as waste heat. Hive wards do not grow food under an open sky, they might do it by domed in super greenhouses, vertical farming, or vast underground artificially lit growth chambers, they might use soil or hydroponics, they might skip plants and meat in favor of big tanks of algae and yeast and artificial flavoring, they might import the food from off-world. All of this produces waste heat, as does every factory, TV, or other process you run, and you're cooked to death if you make heat faster than you can pump it into space. Food is what keeps people alive though, so let's talk about each of these production options really quick and get some estimates. We will use Earth as our baseline, though a hive ward might be a bigger or smaller planet, or moon or asteroid, or even some giant construct built around a stellar remnant. Classic farming is probably limited by access to liquid water and favorable climate, and our current technology would probably let us pump out about 10-20 to times the food we do now if we were focusing on high calorie crops and didn't mind basically plowing everything over. Feeding 20 people per acre or 50 per hectare is plausible enough and there are ocean farming techniques that might pull off similar performance. This number is a little dubious since I'm just multiplying total planetary acreage by current max production, but as we'll see in a moment it's also not likely to be done in favor of doming over. We'll just assume huge power plants or beaming stations are letting you mass produce virtually endless supplies of nitrogen fertilizer and process the other macro and micronutrients out of earth, air, or water too. This could get you close to a trillion people being supported, and ignoring what an ongoing ecological and logistical nightmare this would create, it would probably be stable. This isn't a hive war though because a trillion people could fit in a single state or smaller country at the sorts of population densities we see in dystopian megacity settings or even large modern downtown regions. Stage 2 on something like this is to dome everything over in bits and pieces, it lets you control the temperature and humidity and save on water pumping and keep out pestilence, diseases, air and water contaminants. You would easily more than double your food production in such a setup and this can be done on basically any planet. Our population growth rates aren't terribly high right now and might peak out, otherwise I would say to expect this style of agriculture to become dominant in our lifetimes. It is hard to get exact and meaningful values in a case where everything has been turned into a greenhouse since we don't really have a lot of practice maximizing those for calorie production, but at a minimum we might expect to be able to sustain 100 people per acre or 250 per hectare of land converted, and big floating greenhouses or those in tundras for the worn by piping waste heat up from cities basically makes the whole surface of a planet farmable. That makes populations north of 10 trillion all fed from that planet viable, and still leaves most of the land free of cities if you're going for even fairly modest skyscrapers as the typical home and workplace of humans. This is also assuming no major improvements in how plants are getting light, sunlight on leaves is not super efficient and generally results in less than 1% of the sunlight energy being converted into usable food calories, reflective foils on the soil and genetically engineered plants that could use other wavelengths of light, like green, for photosynthesis might boost those numbers up a lot. And in the context of an agri-world, like the 20 planets dedicated to nothing but farming and sending food to the world city of Trantor in Asmo's foundation, this is probably what those would look like. A world dedicated to farming able to support trillions though, not dozens of wards dedicated to supporting one ward of, in Trantor's case, a mere 40 billion people. Indeed a ward supported by dozens of dedicated agri wards might be able to support a hundred trillion or more people, and some galactic empire of millions of wards could easily dedicate many hundreds of them supporting an ultra-urbanized capital planet of a quadrillion or more people. So amusingly, the grand master of science fiction's portrayal of a planet city is less realistic in scale than Warhammer 40,000, a setting known for its indifference to scientific realism, which casually contemplates hive wards of trillions and gives an estimate of Earth at over a quadrillion. After all, if we compare a single rural county of the US, which has about 3,000 counties, to an empire of a few million wards, a single county would be the equivalent of a thousand planets, and there wouldn't be anything unreal about an agricultural county sending virtually all its product to a nearby hungry metropolis. 
For fans of that setting who post into forums like reddit's r slash 40k lore, of which I'm a regular lurker, the next time someone is arguing the realism of Terra or other hive worlds, this does not, incidentally, imply there is any realism to interstellar shipping of food stocks between planets. Planets have deep gravity wells, and clawing your way out of one with a typical spaceship involves more heat and power than running some grow lights in a hydroponic chamber would, so this should only occur if you have both some cheap space launch option like space elevators or anti-gravity and ultra-easy and fast interstellar space travel, like World to World Wormhole Gates as we see in the Stargate franchise, which is also handy for heat management. Otherwise it makes way more sense to build endless cheap space farms using all that abundant sunlight in the same solar system and general orbital region and shipping the food in. Indeed it generally is better to even run your power production off-world and pipe it down superconductors or as microwave beams, as most of the energy coming out of a power plant is heat, not electricity. In terms of shipping, figure on needing to bring in somewhere around a pound a day or a couple hundred kilograms of food per person per year, or 200 gigatons per trillion people, which is both huge and tiny. A lot of those mile-long ships Sci-Fi is so fond of could handle the entire shipment for a trillion people all on its own just by coming and going once or twice a day, fully loaded. One can imagine needing millions of people and lifting machines to unload that ship, too. It is a bit debatable if this is going to save you heat or energy versus growing on the planet in big hydroponic farms as air breaking a bunch of matter on a high gravity planet like Earth tends to involve converting all its kinetic energy into heat, which is tens of megajoules per kilogram, and actually greater than what an equal weight of chemical fuel would release when burned. The tyrannical rule of the rocket equation fleeces you coming and going, so to speak. It's also all the reason you need to keep things pretty scarce in a fictional story. Food is minimalist and bare bones because it makes the setting grimmer, but in setting the rationale is that a planet will seek to maximize the population it supports, and that will involve stripping all the luxury out of your basic foodstuffs so you can feed more people. Alternatively, bringing stuff up and down space elevators or orbital rings by tethers lets you reclaim a lot of that as electricity and you might be able to profitably grow your food in vast arrays of orbital farms and tether it in possibly by actual physical elevator cars in deep orbits rather than spaceships. This is probably best done with the idea of a potential siege in mind, with stockpiles of food down on the planet and lots of food production there too. Those space farms and space power collectors are not exactly fortified positions, and while a fleet trying to chew through those and a bunch of mixed in space fortresses is going to get beat up badly before they besiege your world, those facilities are going to end up getting mulched. While deep and artificially lit hydroponic ones can be bunkered whole kilometers underground if needed, where even thermonuclear devices would have problems reaching them. What this generally means is that you do want to grow your food on planet if possible, or have that option, and that might be vertically farming in skyscrapers but just as plausible would be underground caverns, especially if defense concerns were an issue. It is possible you would have huge storage vaults that could be emptied in times of problems and turned into growth chambers as they empty, especially as climate controlled artificially lit systems like that have very fast turnaround time on growing food compared to the normal annual growth cycle. Also it is advantageous to grow short storage duration foods on the planet and have a general tendency towards shipping the more durable kinds though such plants like lettuce for instance aren't offering much in terms of calories. They can also help recycle your air and water and keep it clean, and if your environment is that artificial you do need to handle all the otherwise natural cycles, like turning oxygen to carbon dioxide and back again. In terms of food density, it would be very plausible to keep an entire year's worth of food, even in fully processed and packaged form, in less than one cubic meter per person. Strictly speaking, there are 7700 calories in a kilogram of fat, and 100 kilograms would be all the calories a human needed for a whole year, and at a density of 900 kilograms per cubic meter that would be a maximum condensed supply of food for 9 people per cubic meter. Assume the answer for storehouses is somewhere between those two values of 1-9 to people per cubic meter, 
but it means a kilometer wide cubic cavern in a hollow mountain can contain all the food a billion people need for one to nine years, and as you cycle that out, you could convert it to hydroponics. Or if they were stasis vaults or freezers, places to stick your surplus population till the crisis is over. Civilizations with fairly dark and utilitarian attitudes towards its citizens, or ones that are simply desperate, might keep immense cryo vaults packed to the brim with soldiers who they thaw out when needed, riots or seizures, and stuff non-wartime citizens in till it's time to rotate them. And you might need a trillion police officers on a hive ward of a quadrillion people. I could imagine families getting broken up over decades of rotation, only getting to see each other for a few scattered days in their dingy cramped quarters while the kids get stuck in stasis and mommy and daddy rotate because one is a soldier and the other has a job deemed non-critical during a siege, while some centuries-long conflict rages around that solar system of this hive world, its dozen twins, and ten million asteroid colonies and space habitats each an armored fortress that would make the difficulty and scale of the invasion of Normandy in World War II look tiny. It is probably worth noting that even the ultra-cramped dingy quarters we usually see for the common man in such settings is a lot more spacey than a cubic meter, so it should not be hard to find space to store supplies, be it food or ammo or your precious few luxuries. If we're picturing such a world simplistically as an Earth-sized building 2,000 stories tall or deep, then that's a trillion square kilometers, or a quintillion square meters of floor area. Critically on planets like this, while heat is your bottleneck, you have effectively infinite storage space, if you've got the material strong enough and durable enough, or robots good enough, that you can keep and maintain vast unlit caverns or complexes to be used when you need to. And while you do have to worry about overheating the place if you suddenly switch on billions of megawatts of lighting for food growth, you do have a lot of thermal mass you can be flushing heat to on that planet temporarily for during a crisis. In fact you could even bank cooling the same way you bank food, soldiers, and other supplies for a crisis. Food stores would be best kept at cryogenic temperatures, but you could also fill huge caverns with enormous vacuum insulated storage tanks filled with liquid nitrogen. In the raw number sense, we don't know that they might not have food creation paths that did better than 1% energy conversion of light to food, and you can be playing with the artificial sunlight wavelength or frequency to optimize photosynthesis. Maybe they have vast algae vats covering thousands of square miles on dozens of levels, all growing food and recycling waste into more food. Indeed they might just flat out manufacture those macronutrients without involving plants or to be a fairly cybernetic culture. If that 1% value held though, then a human consumes about 3 billion joules a year of food or 300 gigajoules of energy to produce that at 1% efficiency. If you prefer that in wattage, it's around 10,000 watts. Earth gets and emits about 2 times 10 to the 17 watts of sunlight and infrared waste heat, which is 20 trillion times that and I've often used that as the justification for Eucomonopolis having a population of 10 to 20 trillion tops. But again, there are ways to lower that wattage per person and options to radiate more heat, and in the short term, Earth has a huge heat capacity if you're really dug in and able to pipe heat around the crust and mantle, not just your oceans or ice caps, though water has an amazingly high heat capacity and you could keep your oceans in huge chilled cisterns or as ice blocks in vacuum walled chambers just to dump heat into as you need it during troubled times. You might easily get 500 megajoules dumped into a ton or cubic meter of chilled ice, and a given planet might easily have 2 quadrillion cubic meters of water in its oceans and more in its mantle, but that would be 10 to 24 joules of extra temporary heat capacity, many months worth of heat production in its own right for the hydroponics to support a trillion people and a nice supplement to your planet's existing stores of food and waste heat radiation. Seas of liquid fat, or icebergs of it, might actually make more sense for calorie storage and heat sinks, and that is disturbing enough that it would fit a hive ward setting, the frozen fat vaults of mighty Terra, able to feed trillions during a siege. I'm placing so much emphasis on how you can handle a planetary siege because your real limit, especially in a dystopian civilization, on how big such a hive ward could be is how big it could be and survive a couple years of being cut off from supply. 
the game changes immensely if you have special tricks for getting rid of heat, like a wormhole pipeline to various ice giant planets whose high ammonia content actually makes good radiator fluid and fertilizer. Giant towers radiating heat into space also works well, serving as pipelines for transport, power, and heat. You might be able to dump heat into black holes too, we don't really understand their thermodynamics very well, and amusingly the idea of thousands of artificial micro black holes inside your planet is a saner, safer, and more scientifically plausible pathway than a lot of the ones discussed in fiction for these giant planet cities. The takeaway though is that if you've got ultra strong materials and the sort of augmented and automated workforce we tend to expect in even just a few more decades here on Earth, let alone millennia into the future, then you are very likely to go up and down in your construction, and over the centuries a lot of that will still be standing, and if not abandoned, then set aside as useful storage space that nobody really wants to live in. If your structural members can last a thousand years without corroding, then anything you built out of it is still there in a thousand years, and the reality is that for many metals, when they're big and thick, they can really just sit there doing their job for entire eons, they just get a layer of corrosion on the outside that eventually acts like a protective layer, especially if that layer doesn't easily chip or fall off. Even more stable would be ceramic structural members. In this context, even if we assumed a quadrillion people on a planet, that 2000 stories example, which is not that tall, is a thousand square meters of floor area per person. In some dystopian garbage heap, where your typical person lives in a cubby hole a few meters across and works in a cubicle that's smaller, you still have 99% of your space left over for everything else, be it storage or roads and corridors or factories. And again, 2,000 stories, maybe 6 kilometers, is not that tall in a hive city context. You could build towers right into space and all the way down to the mantle. You could also be building this as an enormous shell layer around a gas giant, something like Saturn is perfect for that, and you could dump a lot of heat into that fluid-like planet below. Likewise, we can't imagine using bigger planets, but we can also imagine a hive city on a big and otherwise empty planet, and that changes your packing options. So you can make a sane case for a hive city having many billions or even trillions in it, and a hive world as high as a quadrillion or even more, especially with certain technologies. Indeed, once we toss traditional planets out the window, we have giant shell world options that can rival Dyson swarms themselves in terms of living area, or in the case of the Borch planet, exceed it so much that civilization of quadrillions would qualify as some trivial rounding error. On a planet of a quadrillion, just to add to the grim dark, using our earlier figure, you could have 2.4 trillion mutant cannibals warring over cemetery stasis vaults, who empty out the ordal corpses from distant centuries with the silent unofficial approval of the overlords to clear room for more folks or new uses. Untold empires dwarfing our greatest modern nations could fight over the scraps left in the garbage heap and recycling layers. Keeping to modern scales, it's a place that has more heart surgeons than Earth currently has people, not including the gifted amateurs from among the mutant cannibal tribes. They would have somewhere around a billion active serial killers too, and that's going off modern numbers, not the presumably elevated ones we'd have seen in these sort of dystopian settings. In that city I mentioned earlier, Nessus, we have a scene in the first book, where the equivalent of the local police precinct captain is telling our protagonist some of the city's stats on mortals and suicides, and fans of the series back estimate from that to calculate a population of many tens of millions if not hundreds of millions, and the numbers given are just so overwhelming before you realize that they're actually small compared to our current modern immensity in a civilization of 8 billion. The same number as the total population of all the dystopian megacities of Earth in Asmo's Caves of Steel. So any hive city ought to match those planetary statistics, and a full hive world might bring them up a thousand to a million fold. It is a place where the main university for teaching new dentists has a big auditorium that graduates a new dentist every single second, day and night, every day, no interruption for the last 10,000 years. There are dozens if not hundreds of places doing that for teachers, or police or military officers. 
they could hold a continual parade, a hundred soldiers abreast, marching down a huge road, all day every day, just of new soldiers graduating boot camp and walking up the ramp to troop transports headed off to assault or defend distant planets. We also shouldn't assume the surface of such a world is a flat metal sheet of uniform altitude. Rather it would be akin to a patchwork quilt of a billion different megaprojects, some rising just a few hundred stories above ground and covered in heat radiating panels, other places would see artificial mountains, not alone skinny tower but thousands of them together, each a thin spiral against the immense mountain of the hive, but each a home to 10 million people, all to maximize heat radiation and a view of the outside scenery. Some of these towers might rise even into low orbit, to be intersected by multiple orbital rings providing docking and ultra-fast travel to and from orbit as well as around the planet, with millions of trains running along them, up where the barely existing atmosphere provides no air drag. Hives don't have to be dirty and depressing places, that's just the sci-fi setting needing it for the plot, and we've discussed that more in our episodes on Nucumonopolises, Arcologies, and Matryoshka shell worlds. They do generally need to be dark though, as light that it hasn't reflected is absorbed as heat, so you can't have entire immense farms, gardens, parks, and nature preserves in such worlds. Indeed you might have entire continents worth of each tucked down around various levels. But unless you're favoring shade gardens or mushroom forests, that lighting is coming out of your effective maximum population and other heat producing activities. Such places are likely to be better known for their dimly lit caverns full of tree-sized mushrooms, stalactites, and dimly glowing crystal clusters than for their vast redwood forests. You could have truly massive ecologies on such a world too, even if it was only running on a small percentage of the energy lost to waste and garbage. There is also the virtual realm, as such a planet might hold computational capacity to simulate whole galaxies worth of planets and more surreal virtual realms and humans with implants and augmented reality might almost slide casually between this prime reality and the various virtual domains they also dwell in, though this style of hive world, all virtual, might prefer some very spread out artificial space station for maximum heat radiation and revolves around your best computronium and heat dissipation rather than food production and heat radiation. Indeed in extreme cases, a planet might contain many trillions of people living matrix style in pods, or even simply as brains in jaws, or as uploaded minds. They may have virtual afterlives in these simulated worlds, and you might have entire layers of a planet given over to storing the dead of prior millennia, well preserved or possibly in stasis or frozen for eventual revival. Entire layers might be sealed off over time and left cold and dark, and locked up as tombs, as their residents decide to sleep forward to distant futures, and new layers are simply built on top of them, much to their surprise when and if they wake up. Your hive is a tomb world, and the levels in many regions are like geological strata, because space is not at a premium when heat and energy are. All that changes if you have clock tech heat management options, then you can have enormous forests rolling for untold miles, a million layers of diamond and hyposteel all beneath fake skies, with vast flowing rivers on the landscape, moving heat to pipes that ran through wormholes to cold places in deep space to move the heat and generate even more power. Those places might be actual suburbs and farms connected to that main planet perpetually. Some wards would also be mostly immune to that problem, as a hive city might be an asteroid a dozen kilometers across that's been mostly hollowed out to add living space and provide construction materials for higher layers, which again are probably many jutting protrusions of towers rather than simple spherical shells, a smooth surface does not radiate heat as well as a crinkled or jutting one. Several thousand cubic kilometers should be able to house billions of folks all on its own, and heat radiation is less severe for smaller objects which have fewer layers per unit of radiating surface area. Indeed you might opt for a series of caverns deep inside a rocky ice ball far from your sun, which would actually fit the hive concept better. You have some fortified starport as your ant hill entrance or entrances, but the true city is far below and most of your upper layers are essentially big radiator tubes acting almost like rebar in concrete kilometers of sturdy shielding, heat management, and lower priority storage, all sneaking around in tight corridors to be a nightmare for any invasion force. 
These might be your mines too, as in all but the largest asteroids, you can burrow down and build from the center out almost as easily as from the top downward. If it's classic sci-fi, we just have artificial gravity, but under current known science everything is provided by rotating, which means long skinny cylinders in your tunnels, probably sheathed in non-rotating outer layers. As you dig ever more tunnels out, with many even running parallel or adjoining, you take the excess spill from those spots and dump it on the surface, slowly expanding your radiating surface area to allow more heat dissipation. Who knows how many hundreds of centuries it would take for even a colony of millions to mine out and use up even a relatively small rocky or icy body a dozen kilometers in radius, and we might imagine parallel versions and floating rigid blimp tunnels and hives woven into the upper atmosphere of gas giants or Venus-like worlds. Those are good for refining and mining those colossal atmospheres for resources. If building your hive into a place like Pluto, named for the god of the underworld, or into Venus, which might as well be a suburb of Hell, or the eternal megastorms of a gas giant doesn't count as a bleak and depressing place to build your megacity, I don't know what is, but with the right clock tech you could build these things into dead stars or black holes too, or even inside wormhole-like gate spaces like the web city of Komarag. As always I don't see any need for these places to be bleak and depressing, except for the sake of dark or fiction but the sheer scale of them guarantees tiny fractions that are decrepit or gang-ridden, and those areas would be plentiful simply because a city 10,000 times the size of our largest modern ones can have gang or clans bigger, better, and more organized than many a modern country's military, while still being a tiny rogue fragment of the greater whole. As always, I would argue that whether or not our future is in such cities, or more utopian ones, is much more a reflection of the character of a civilization than its actual technology and resources, though it is nice to have all of the above, especially if you're aiming to build cities so grand that they sprawl over continents and reach into the heavens themselves. So this episode comes out mid-May, and for a lot of our viewers that means you made it through another set of final exams, and for some folks it was their last one. If you just graduated, congratulations, and good luck with your next step, whatever form that takes. It took a lot of hard work and determination to devote yourself to something for multiple years and stick at it. Sometimes people realize partway through that their chosen major isn't what they want to do after all, or wasn't what they expected and change it. The same applies to careers. Most people spend about 80,000 hours of their life in their job, 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year for 40 years, and would prefer that they enjoyed their work and that their work helped the world. 80,000 hours is a lot of time, and a massive resource to accomplish things with, so it's a good idea to do some research on what career to pick. And that's where our friends at 80,000 Hours come in, they are a non-profit that spent a decade alongside academics at Oxford University researching what careers have the most impact, and all the research is on their website for free. 80,000 Hours wants to help you find a fulfilling career that does good too, and so their website is full of free tools to help you find the right path for you, and lots of decision making tools, such as their 8 week career planning course. There's a podcast with entertaining insights and interviews discussing the world's pressing problems and what you can do about them, and a jobs board with tons of opportunities from entry level to advanced. I found over a hundred opportunities just focused on AI safety and policy, and all over the map both literally and in required experience. 80,000 Hours gives you the resources and leads to help find the career you love and that makes the world a better place, and again, 80,000 Hours is free, completely. If you're looking for a career that works on one of the world's most pressing problems, sign up now at 80,000hours.org slash Isaac Arthur. Incidentally, if you want to hear more about Hive Cities, specifically from the Warhammer 40,000 setting, there's a great deep dive on the topic by Luton, which I'll link, and a lot of those concepts would translate over outside that specific setting too. That setting isn't hyper-realistic overall but does give the topic a lot more thought than any other fictional or non-fiction setting I'm aware of, and it is a huge topic. Which is why today's episode is a companion piece to this upcoming Thursday's episode on Hungry Aliens, but even after writing both I still felt we had left out a big element of the logistics that didn't really fit in either episode, so I recently wrote a short bonus episode, Space Freighters, 
that will be out on Nebula later this week, and I suspect we'll be discussing that matter more down the road too. We have a lot of other episodes to get to before that though, I think the schedule of scripts is loaded all the way up to September at this point, which is why I thought a shorter overview now was better than waiting. Speaking of those episodes, we'll have a live stream coming up a week from now, Sunday, May 21st, then two weekends from now I'll be down at the International Space Development Conference in Frisco, Texas helping co-host that, and before that we have our look at Warping Reality on May 25th where we'll examine a lot of ways various higher technologies might alter space, time, physical constants, and more. Then it's into June to look at colonizing the Kuiper Belt, followed by a look at how we can build enormously tall and strong structures, like high citadels, in space towers. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also help support the show on Patreon, and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service Nebula, along with hours of bonus content at go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur. As always, thanks for watching, and have a great week.